Your Eminences, Reverend Fathers, beloved sisters and brothers in Christ, our beloved students of the Master Program in Orthodox Communical Theology of the International Hellenic University, ladies and gentlemen. Today's lecturer needs no introduction. Nevertheless, I'll uh, try to sum up in a few words his important work and presence in Christian Orthodox theology over the last years. The Reverend Professor John Chrysavis, Archdeacon of the Ecumenical Patriarchate, born in Australia, studied in Athens and Oxford, and taught in Sydney and Boston. He was a co-founder of St. Andrew's Theological College in Sydney, where he was sub-dean and taught patri patristics and church history. He was also a lecturer in the Divinity School and the School of Studies in Religion at the University of Sydney. Uh, he was appointed professor of theology at Holy Cross School of Theology in Boston and directed the Religious Studies program at Hellenic College until 2002. In recent years, he, was published, he has published several books and countless articles in international journals and encyclopedias in the area of religion and ecology, social justice and peace. He currently serves as a theological advisor to the Ecumenical Patriarch on environmental issues. In 2016, he was awarded an honorary doctorate by St. Vladimir Theological Seminary. And in 2020, he was elected honorary professor of theology in the Sydney College of Divinity. He is also an honorary member of uh, SEMES, Center of Ecumenical, Missiological and Environmental Studies, Metropolitan Pandelimo Pagiorgiu, in its newly established form, and member of the scientific committee of this master program. I have the honor to teach the core course on ecology and interfaith dialogue under his guidance, since as our students know, we're focusing on the text that he suggested. Concerning his publications, to name but a few, he's the author of Life Through Darkness, the Orthodox Tradition, Toward an Ecology of Transfiguration, Orthodox Christian Perspective on Environment, Nature and Creation, On Earth as in Heaven, Ecological Vision and Initiatives of Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew, and one of his latest books, Creation as Sacrament, Reflection on Ecology and Spirituality, one of the books that we discuss uh, really often with our students, uh, which hopefully soon will be available in Greek as well. Uh, we're going to watch a lecture that uh, he gave last March at the University of St. Mary of the Lake for the Meyer Lecture Series titled On Earth as in Heaven Toward an Ecological Ethos and Worldview. And after the end of the lecture, Reverend Professor John Chrysavis will be with us online to discuss, comment and answer possible questions that we might have. So let's start with the video. Let me start by taking you by the hand and leading you back on a journey, a journey back to what churches and theologians like to call the beginning. That's often, and rightly so, the preferred starting point for speaking about the environment, at least in Christian circles. But whenever people think of the Genesis story, they focus on our creation by a loving God and they forget our connection to the environment. It could be a natural reaction, could be a sign of our arrogance maybe, but the truth is that Christians tend to overemphasize our creation in the image and likeness of God and overlook our creation from the dust of the ground. Well, I would claim that our heavenliness should not overshadow our earthliness. Most people are actually unaware that we humans did not get a day to ourselves in the creation story. In fact, we shared that sixth day with all the 
creeping and crawling things of the world, all the sorts of uh, bugs and insects you would not want in your bed at night. We shared the creation day with them. We don't have to talk about human beings as in, in, in exceptionalistic or hubristic terms. Perhaps our uniqueness lies simply in our peculiar relationship to nature. The story of Noah, just as the creation story, they both tell us that saving humanity is inseparable from saving other creatures. And it's helpful to remember that. It's humble to remember that truth. And if we tend to forget, well, in recent years, we've been painfully reminded of this reality with the cruel flora and fauna extinction, with the irresponsible soil and forest clearance, with the unacceptable noise, air and water pollution. And still, still, our concern for the environment should not be reduced to some superficial or sacramental, uh, sorry, sentimental love. It's a way of honoring our creation by God. It's a way of hearing the groaning of creation. It should be an affirmation of the truth of that sixth day of creation. Anything less than the truth, than the full truth and nothing but the truth, is dangerous heresy. And by the way, speaking of heresy, when assessing the ecological crisis is not too far-fetched at all. Because whenever we speak of heavenly or earthly things, we're always inevitably drawing on established values that we have of ourselves and our world, the technical language that we adopt, the particular species that we want to preserve. All of these depend on principles that we promote, even presume. You know, we tend to call our predicament an ecological crisis. But the root of the problem lies in the paradigms that impel us to pursue a particular lifestyle. The crisis concerns the way we imagine our world. It's essentially a battle over images and icons. It's how we see the world around us. In classical traditions, human beings regarded themselves as descendant from God or the gods. They looked on the world as soulful, not soulless, as sacred, like them, not subjected to them. In their experience, every flower, every bird, every star was holy. The sap of the trees was their lifeblood. Nature was not for experimentation or exploitation, and trade was never at the expense of nature. So when I consider the experience, for instance, of the Christian tradition, and in particular my own tradition as an Orthodox Christian, I turn to its distinct symbols and values, which include icons that I would interpret as the way we are supposed to view and perceive creation. And I think of liturgy, which I interpret as the way we're supposed to celebrate and respond and respect creation. And I think of ascesis, that we'll talk about a little later, which I interpret as the way we treat creation, the way we behave toward the rest of nature. Early Christian mystics recognized that when our eyes are opened to the beauty of the world, then we can clearly see the divine sparks scattered everywhere. So let's look at these three dimensions separately. The iconic vision, first, of nature. Seeing clearly is exactly what icons teach us to do. 
The world of the icon reveals the eternal dimension in everything we see, everything we experience. Our generation, it might be said, is characterized by a sense of self-centeredness toward the natural world, by a lack of awareness of the beyond. You know, when Noah saved the animals two by two, he wasn't saving specimens or species, he was saving an ecosystem. And we've broken that covenant between ourselves and God. Now, in Orthodox spirituality, the icon reflects the restoration of that sacred covenant. It reminds us of another world. It speaks, in this world, the language of the age to come. The icon provides a corrective to our culture that gives value only to the here and now. The icon aspires to the inner vision of everything, to the world as created, as intended by God. And the first image that an iconographer will always attempt is the transfiguration of Christ on Mount Tabor. Precisely because the iconographer strives to hold together this world and the next, because by disconnecting this world from heaven, we actually desacralize both. This is where the teaching about Jesus Christ at the very heart of iconography emerges. In the icon of Jesus Christ, the uncreated God assumes a human face, a beauty, as Dostoevsky wrote, that can save the world. And in Orthodox icons, faces are always frontal. They always depict two eyes gazing back at the beholder. The conviction here is that Christ is in our midst. Profile signifies sin, as here with Judas in profile. Profile implies rupture. Whereas faces, communion is always frontal. All eyes, as the Desert Fathers would say, profoundly receptive, eternally susceptive of divine grace. I see means that I am seen, which means that I am in love. Remember the title of C.S. Lewis's love story, till we have faces. Love compels us to see things differently, to see things from another perspective, to see things from the perspective of another, to see things from the perspective of the future. Ecology is much more than flora and fauna. It's about that social nexus that surrounds them. So the icon converts the beholder from a restricted worldview to a fuller vision. And the light in the icons is the light of reconciliation. It's not the waning light of this world. It's a light, to quote one orthodox hymn, that knows no evening. And so icons depicting events that occurred in daytime are no brighter than icons depicting events that occurred at nighttime. For example, the icon of the descent from the cross, no darker than the icon of the ascension, the icon of the nativity, no brighter than the icon of the crucifixion. The somber light of the Last Supper mirrors the same light of the supreme feast of light, the transfiguration, because the icon presupposes, again to quote another Orthodox Easter hymn, a different way of living. In fact, the whole world is seen differently in icons. The whole world is seen as a ladder or an icon. In fact, everything is a sign of God, as the, the second century mystic said which is precisely why in icons, rivers assume a human form. 
so too do the sun and the moon, as if a child is painting them. The stars, the waters, they all have human faces. They all acquire a personal dimension, just like us, just like God. Now, the destruction of our planet's ecosystems and resources can only be restrained if we begin to see nature as an icon. Take any painting. The narcissist will see a wooden frame. If he is cold, he will burn it to keep warm. An altruist will see a sacred canvas. She will admire it. Recall the uniqueness of the artist, a Rembrandt or a Van Gogh. Only when our attitude to the painting changes do we value it. So if the world is an icon, it means that nothing lacks sacredness. Put bluntly, if you can't find God in this world, you're not going to find him in heaven either. So let's turn to liturgy now, because what icons achieve in space, in matter, in wood, the liturgy accomplishes in song, in chant, the same ministry of reconciliation between heaven and earth. What the icon achieves in material, liturgy accomplishes in music, the same ministry of reconciliation. If icons are an artistic means for the created world to remain in communication with the uncreated God, then liturgy is the aesthetic medium for our world to reach communion with its creator. It's a way of reconciliation. It's what theologians like to call at one atonement. In fact, the Greek word for atonement, for forgiveness, for reconciliation, the word synhoresis implies not sinfulness and repentance or guilt and... By the way, I don't speak Spanish, but in the Mass today I got the peccato part and got the culpa part. We're really good at that as Christians. But the word for forgiveness in Greek, synhoresis, literally means, simply means, being in the same space with everyone else. That's what happens during liturgy. That's what happens during Mass. So when I say liturgy or liturgical, I don't just mean ritual. I mean relational. Or again, in the context of icons that we mentioned before, think of the world as a picture. You need every part of an image in order for it to be complete. Removing one part of the picture, a tree, an animal, a human being distorts the whole picture. If we are guilty of relentless abuse and waste of our planet's resources, it could be because we've lost this spirit of liturgy, of worship. We're no longer respectful pilgrims in the world. We've become tourists. We have to restore this sense of awe and delight in our relationship to the world. The truth is that we respond to nature with the same delicacy, the very same sensitivity and tenderness with which we respond to any human person. You know, through the ecumenical movement or through other social programs, we've learned that we cannot treat people like things. Well, let me propose to you today that we have to begin to learn not to treat even things like mere things. All of our spiritual activities are measured by their impact on the world, on people, especially the poor. And the liturgy is the language that commemorates, that celebrates the innate, that intimate connection between God and people and things, what in the seventh century St. Maximus the Confessor called a cosmic liturgy, and what in the same century Abba Isaac the Syrian described as acquiring a merciful heart, a heart that burns with love for all of creation, for humans, 
for birds, for the beasts, even for demons, he says, for all of God's creatures. And in the early 20th century, Fyodor Dostoevsky conveyed the same vision in his brother's Karamazov, when he said, love all of God's creation, every grain of sand, love every leaf, every ray of God's light. If you love everything, you will perceive the divine mystery in all things. There's a dimension of music and of art and of beauty and of song in the world, which also implies, by the way, for us as Christians, for people studying for the priesthood, that whenever we narrow life, religious life, but also political life, social life, whenever we narrow it to ourselves and our own interests, we're neglecting our vocation to reconcile all of God's creation. Because our relationship with this world determines our relationship with heaven. The way we treat the earth is reflected in the way we kneel before God. Okay, that's the good news. Of course, unless you live in Maine, this world does not always look or feel like heaven. And in the wake of the Fukushima nuclear disaster in 2011, or BP's oil disaster a year before that, it was admittedly a little difficult to perceive what Dostoevsky called the divine mystery in all things. So how do we reconcile this mystery with reality? For Christian theology, the answer lies in a tree. As John Chrysostom observed in the fourth century when he was commenting on Paul's letter to the Colossians, God, says Paul, was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, through the blood of his cross. And reference here to the blood of the cross is an indication that there's a cost involved when we fail to recognize the sacredness of creation. The cross reminds us of the reality of human failure and the radical reversal that's required in our perspectives and practices. There's a price to pay for our wasting. The balance of the world has been shattered and the ecological crisis will not just be solved with smiley stickers. The tree of the cross is what presents the solution as a self-discipline, self-denial. That's what I mean by ascesis. The antidote, basically, to self-centeredness. The cross is not just an empty symbol. It's certainly not bling jewelry. It's the expression of brokenness, the confession of failure, which may be the reason why so many are in denial about climate change, claiming it's a hoax or claiming it can be fixed with Band-Aid solutions, because it's hard work to resolve, to reconcile. So in orthodox spiritual teaching, the cross translates into ascesis. Here is Anthony, the father of monasticism in early Egypt. It's the way of assuming responsibility for one's actions and one's world, because it's really critical to look in the mirror from time to time and to ask, is what I have what I need? Did I travel here on a plane to deliver a talk on the environment? How do I reflect the world's thirst for oil or greed that is destroying the planet? Of course, the earth keeps reminding us of our denial, and yet we still stubbornly refuse to accept that our comfortable lives, dependent on cheap energy, are somehow responsible for the millions of gallons of oil polluting the Gulf of Mexico. How can we logically believe that a century of pumping oil-fired pollution into the atmosphere 
won't have any ramifications. And ascesis is more than just self-discipline. It's ultimately learning to be free. It's learning to be uncompelled by ways that use or abuse the world. It's learning to be characterized by self-control, by the ability to say no or enough. Why is it that my pet dog, Emily, knew when enough was enough? And I don't. Ascesis aims at not detachment or destruction, but refinement, restoration. Take the example of fasting. We're at the beginning of Great Lent. Learning to fast is learning not just to give up, it's learning to give. It's learning to share. It's all about communion. It's recognizing in other people faces and in the earth the very face of God. And here, I think, lies the heart of the problem. Because we are unwilling. In fact, quite frankly, we violently resist any call to adopt simpler lives. People just don't want that. Everyone in this room is guilty of consuming far more than we should, far more than someone in Malawi. We have to recover that spirituality of uh, simplicity, of frugality, li living in a way that promotes harmony, not division, acknowledging that the earth is the Lord's. Think of a couple of images that we have that teach the same truth. Food. And food in its corollary vices of greed or gluttony, which vices, by the way, are not vices that you can't easily see. You can see greed and gluttony. Or the concomitant symptoms of food, of indifference or waste. Food comprises the most striking factor in ecological exploitation and economic inequity. The reason people go hungry today is not the number of people in the world. If there were fewer people, but the way we distribute food remained the same, the poor would still go hungry. The problem is the way we distribute food through the free market as private property, which people who are poor cannot afford. And there are two particular images in the Christian tradition that speak to our response to the ecological crisis, specifically on the matter of food. In the first, which is derived from the Gospel parable, Jesus tells of a, a poor man, Lazarus, who lay at the gate of a rich man, as St. Luke says, longing to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. The rich man never once invited Lazarus to his table. In fact, what's worse, the rich man probably never even noticed Lazarus. I wonder sometimes whether we even notice what goes on around us. How many people do we invite to sit at our table? What issues, poverty or peace, or gun violence, or health care, or human rights, how many issues do we readily embrace? Or, to paraphrase a contemporary politician, perhaps the time has come to admit that the problem lies with those who gorge themselves. The problem is not the immigrant. The problem is not any particular religion. The problem is the insatiable greed of some who incessantly stuff themselves. And that problem, too, has a face and it has a name. Then there's another well-known icon, an iconographic depiction about food and communion 
sitting under the shade of the oak trees at Mamre, where Abraham welcomed an unexpected visit from three strangers. The story is recorded in Genesis 18, also in Hebrews 13. It describes the patriarch of Israel spontaneously sharing his friendship and food, extending such generous hospitality to foreigners, to complete strangers, that, at least in the Orthodox tradition, that scene is symbolical of the Holy Trinity and nothing less. In fact, the only authentic image of God as Trinity in the Orthodox Church is this encounter scene from rural Palestine. And traditional icons of Abraham's hospitality, as it's known, Sarah's usually left out, portray the guests on three sides of the table. They always leave an open space on the fourth side of the table because the scene is an open invitation. Of course, as then Senator Barack Obama told the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People's Fight for Freedom in 2005, it's one thing that everyone has a seat at the table, but how is everyone going to pay for the meal? Or think of Pope Francis during his visit to the U.S. in 2015, declining a meal with the U.S. Congress and choosing to eat with the homeless in a neighboring park. There's a unique iconographic depiction of all this, this worldview, in an 18th century icon that's found in Crete in a monastery. It's literally a theological statement in color. The icon's title comes from the great blessing of the waters at the Feast of Epiphany on January 6th. It's repeated in the baptism of every Orthodox Christian. Great are you, Lord, and wondrous are your works. No words suffice to him your wonders. At the far left of the image, nature is portrayed as Mother Earth, that indigenous peoples throughout the world, whether the Indians of North America or the Aborigines of Australia, the Mother Earth that they have respected for centuries. The epic poet of ancient Greece writes, she is the mother of all and the oldest of all. She nourishes all, all creatures that walk on the land, move in the deep or fly in the air. So nature here extends her arms in a gesture of openness, of embrace. And then the icon also depicts urban life. There's the city of Samaria, the city of Nineveh in the background. It depicts agricultural life with the farmers tilling the slopes. And we can see people and rivers and vegetation. And a vast rainbow reflects the eternal covenant between the creator and creation. The icon's rich in symbolism, but let me highlight two particular scenes. The first depicts Jonah cast from the mouth of the large beast, as in the biblical story, a profound image of resurrection, of course, and renewal of all things. One of the early symbols of Christ, of course, whereby Christians recognized one another was, well, the fish. The Greek word ichthys being an acronym for Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior. So the fish, is a statement of faith. Christ is integrally, inseparably identified with fish. And abuse of fishing or overfishing relates in a very personal way to Christ, in a very profound way to Christ, in a very painful way to Christ. The second scene depicts the slaying of Abel right in the middle there under the rainbow curve. The slaying of Abel by Cain, a violent representation of the destructive impact of our current policies and practices, especially for future generations. Because until we perceive in the pollution of our planet the portrait of our brother and sister, we cannot resolve the injustice and inequality of our world until we discern in the pollution of our planet the face of our children 
we cannot comprehend the irreversible consequences of our actions. So where do we go from here? My elder son and I once paid a visit to the optometrist, and Alex is not as meticulous as he should be with his eye care and many other things. So as he received his new prescription, I could hear his reaction of surprise inside the room. He said, wow, that's what I'm supposed to see? When we look at our world, what do we see? Because the view, the way we view our world reflects the way that we will relate to our world. We treat our planet in a God-forsaken manner because we see it in this way. And in his now classic article entitled The Roots of Our Ecological Crisis, I get criticized for referring to him. People say he's not a church father. I know. In his article, Lynn White, medieval historian, I think he suspected this truth when he said, the Greek saint contemplates, the Western saint acts. The Latins, he says, felt that sin was moral evil, that salvation lay in right conduct, and the implications of Christianity for the conquest of nature will emerge more easily in the Western atmosphere. I think there's something profound in what he says here, because far too often we think that solving the ecological crisis is a matter of doing something different, of acting differently, maybe more effectively, more sustainably, whatever word people use. I recall an article a few years ago which I paraphrase here for our purposes, originally published in the Wall Street Journal. The article said, yes, the world is sinking, and the band keeps playing. On the Titanic, first violinist, Big Oil's Koch brothers. For them, capitalism is the solution to everything. Everyone has a price. Everything has a price especially politicians. Second chair, the world's moral authority, Patriarch Bartholomew and Pope Francis warning we're destroying the planet and playing a mean solo flute, Mother Nature, who doesn't care what climate change deniers think, but only what we do. Handing climate change over to capitalism or politicians is as good an idea as asking the iceberg to fix the Titanic. Whereas paradoxically, ecological correction might begin, if we use uh, Lynn White's hint, with in environmental inaction. It's a matter of contemplation. It's a matter, go back to the words we said about icons. It's a matter of seeing things differently. We're back to the notion of image and liturgy. First, we must stop what we're doing. And then we might gain a new insight into the world. And if we peer through that lens, well, foreign policy even looks different. The economy looks different. These now begin to allow us to abandon the urge for unbridled expansion and to focus on the sustainability we so desperately need. We can see the world in ways other than through the glass of the market. There actually can be a green way of looking at the world apart from that of Alan Greenspan. Some years ago, a presidential advisor and World Bank economist declared, oh, what the heck, Larry Summers is his name, 
America, he said, cannot and will not accept any speed limit on economic growth. Really? Have we become so addicted to fantasies about riches without risk or profit without price? What is it about the model of life that we've tragically created that we override our own better judgment in service of our selfish nature? Do we honestly believe that our endless, mindless manipulation of the Earth's resources comes at no cost, no consequence? Our economy, our technology, our society become toxic when divorced from our vocation to see the world as God would see the world. And if God saw the world, as we said at the beginning this evening, as very good on that sixth day of creation, then we too can see the world in its unfathomable beauty and interrelatedness. What we face is a radical choice, like Moses was offered in Deuteronomy. Today, I'm giving you a choice between good and evil, between life and death, choose life. The question I leave you with is this. How do we live in such a way that reflects spiritual values, that communicates generosity and gratitude, not arrogance and greed? Because if we don't, then a significant patch of the Gulf Coast in our country will have been lost in vain. And the Fukushima nuclear disaster precipitated by the tsunami will have gone unnoticed if we don't. But if we do, if we do, we will hear the earth groan. We will notice the grass grow and we will feel the seal's heartbeat. Thank you. Uh, okay, um, first of all, uh, I would like to welcome Reverend Professor John Chrysavis for honoring us with his presence uh, today. Welcome, uh, Father John, to our company. It's good to be with you. Thank you, Nico. Yeah. Um, just a very briefly, I would like to, to, to share something. Um, I watched more than once today's lecture, to be honest with you, and I cannot distinguish any particular point which I would like to emphasize. And the reason is that the presentation was so rich in meanings and definitely um, I don't consider it only a lecture for academic purposes concerning the orthodox spirituality on environmental uh, issues, but also in a more personal note, a lecture so important for <clears throat> our journey of life and for finding numerous reasons to respect nature and to respect and understand what creation uh, really is. So right after I watched the lecture for the first time, two things happened. The first one is that I, I read again, word by word, the sixth day of creation from the book of Genesis. And the second thing was the picture of Noah and his ark, saving, like we've heard, not species, but an ecosystem. So those words of uh, Professor Reverend John Chrysargis, in addition to this picture of Noah with the ark, stuck in my mind and uh, made me think more deeply on what creation really is. And that God, since the beginning of times, provided his knowledge, this particular knowledge, to the people. I really want to share more, but my role today, unfortunately, is to monitor the discussion. Plus, I don't want to waste the precious moments uh, we have to listen to uh, Father John, what Father John has to say. So I will stop here and I'll give the floor 
firstly to Father John, uh, and in, uh, in the meantime, I'll gather uh, some questions and I will forward them uh, to you as well. So, uh, Professor, the floor is yours. Dr. Dimitriades, thank you very much. First of all, for the opportunity of um, uh, speaking and recording uh, discussion for your class uh, in the master's program, um, but uh, also to talk about an issue that has come to mean a lot to me, not as an issue in itself, but as an issue that uh, symbolizes uh, the role of uh, the church and of theology. Uh, in the modern world. Um, it, it's come to be uh, an image, if you like, of uh, what the church should be dealing with, uh, where the church should be. Um, so in, in that respect, I don't feel that I'm a specialist in any sense of the term on environmental issues, um, but that I do care deeply about these issues. Um, I also want to say what a joy it is to see some uh, well-known uh, friendly faces um, from the universities in Thessaloniki and in Athens. Um, it's a real pleasure to have you and an honor to have you uh, sitting in. Okay. okay. So first I will Okay, first of all, yes, one to start. Uh, Father John, listening to your lecture, the way you only can do it, um, I realized why. Um, our Christian, I wouldn't say Orthodox, but our Christian reaction to the climate change uh, came from, uh, let's say, from uh, Patriarch Bartholomew and the, the whole project uh, of uh, the Ecumenical Patriarchate. Long before, I'm saying this uh, 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 after um, my investigation, preparing the so-called SEMES project on integral ecology and realizing that uh, the initiative of the Christian church, of course, um, represented by the Ecumenical Patriarchate was slightly before both the scientists concerned and the concern of the politicians. And uh, I wonder whether this is true because uh, I tried hard to uh, find uh, uh, evidence that um, there was uh, um, earlier attempts by scientists or by politicians which I don't know, you can help me on this. But my concern is to uh, ask you to uh, say a little bit more about the last model of the three you have chosen, icon, liturgy, and as cases. And this is my concern, which is related to the period we are in, the great uh, land, uh, which is in a way also, not only, as you mentioned, it's giving, not only abstaining from, but it's also related to the uh, prohibition of slaughtering um, um, animals, eating meat, because in the earlier uh, culture, uh, of course, uh, they were not they were not butchers uh, like uh, or supermarkets uh, like the one we have. So we had to do it 
in a period of uh, repentance, um, making an act of violence. And this was not uh, even in the document of the Holy and Great Synod was underlined. And in uh, some ecumenical uh, uh, events, uh, I have met and I encountered with uh, uh, other concerns of other people, some of them from uh, our Orthodox tradition, but also from the other uh, uh, denominations, asking about the, the church's attitude towards behaving um, the animals. And I don't know whether it is um, a vegetarianism or a spiritual uh, question or concern, but I would like you to elaborate a little bit more to this last uh, ascesis uh, um, uh, symbolic uh, element you have chosen in your uh, presentation. That's for the start. I don't want to uh, distract uh, the whole uh, discussion, but uh, even uh, an passant in passing, uh, you can tell us something more. Thank you. So we'll, we'll have distracted the whole discussion, I hope. <laughs> You've touched on three large topics, so um, I, I want to just briefly respond to them. Uh, the first is the the time that uh, the timeline here, the the fact that the Ecumenical Patriarchate has been doing this for you know over three decades now, uh, since the mid to the late eighties, uh, which coincided, by the way, with the time that I returned from my studies. Um, in um, England and Greece, um, back to Australia. Um, I had studied the, the early Desert Fathers who were still at the center of my academic research. And uh, I was interested in issues of environment that remain at the heart of my passion. But I wondered, I remember asking myself as I flew over four hours of desert of Australia uh, to get to my home in Sydney. Um, how on earth I would relate these two things? Uh, I mean, in a meaningful way, uh, what is it that I could bring from the Desert Fathers to a very almost godless society uh, in Australia? Uh, at least in, in the white community. And one thing I realized immediately was the connection, the intimate connection between geography, right? Even if it's a secular nation, place and uh, spirituality of uh, tradition and even an ancient tradition. And I became aware that the natural landscape uh, and the Aboriginal almost story time had maybe more to teach me than I could imagine. Maybe that's where the connection might happen. And in fact, in my first uh, publication, long out of print now, and I'm kind of glad about it actually, but uh, it was entitled, The Desert is Alive. And the aim of it was to tell the story of Australia, tell the history of Australia, tell the theology of Australia from the perspective of the land, from the perspective of uh, the Aboriginal people. Um, and again, in my own life, to give you a sense of the timing here, that book appeared in 1990. The first encyclical issued by Patriarch Demetrius was in 1989. The first time I met and began to work with Patriarch Bartholomew was in 1991. So it was inevitable that these sort of connections um, influenced, uh, shaped my way of thinking very early on and what I would be interested in, in terms of um, theological uh, perspective. Um, but a second point here, uh, because you, uh, oh, and by the way, I've remembered all of these things uh, in recent days because of the passing also of Prince Philip, uh, who was very close 
to and involved in the very early um, patriarchal initiatives um, under um, Demetrius and then under Bartholomew. Uh, but talking about these connections that I wanted to make between Australia, say, and my theology, my tradition, um, I don't think it's a coincidence that uh, among you that I'm looking at right now, there are a number of theologians who are involved in uh, ecumenical discussions and ecumenical issues, because that's another way of making connections. That's what it's ultimately all about. It's about making connections between ourselves and the rest of the world, between our own understanding, theological perspective, and that of others. And the dignity, the, the cultured way is to be able to converse, to be able to receive and to give, uh, not to be hardened in any way. And many of you have made uh, those connections in your own theology and your uh, own um, ecumenical uh, engagements. Um, or even Father Kumarianos, uh, when we're dealing with liturgy, it, it surely is all about how do we make connections between what happens on the altar and what happens outside the church? So that's, I think, what theology should be negotiating, should be dealing with, should be balancing at all times. How do we make these connections? And you spoke of theology, you know, predating almost the scientific uh, sort of emphasis on environmental degradation. Um, it's probably around the same time that these things happened. Um, I would not say that we predated the scientists. We probably predated the politicians, that's for sure, but then everyone always predates the politicians. Um, but it, it is important, and I keep reminding even our own, that um, theology generally came very late to this discussion and maybe even reluctantly to this discussion. Uh, we don't like criticism. We don't like being told that maybe we've done things wrongly. Maybe we've focused on anthropology. Maybe we've focused on just the male. Maybe we've focused on just the body. Maybe we've focused um, on uh, you know, just one aspect of theology more than others and not seen that global, that cosmic perspective. So. Uh, it is, I think, a matter of uh, both reality and humility to remember that, in fact, the scientists uh, were well ahead of us on this. And in ecumenical circles, I'm just remembering now my um, longtime fr respected friend, um, Professor Charles Birch in Australia, who gave a very strong um, keynote presentation in the 1975 General Assembly, I think that was in Africa, in Kenya, Nairobi. Nairobi. Um, and uh, he spoke about environmental issues there. That was 1975, if I'm right, Nairobi. Um, and uh, that was well before any patriarchal uh, sort of um, initiatives. So that's in response to your second point. And then now in response to your third, which is the most difficult and uh, the one that I probably get criticized most about, um, and that is the emphasis on askesis. And people say that's a negative way of responding to environmental uh, issues. There should be a more positive way, one that is um, uh, more appealing to people. And it's true, askesis is not a very comfortable uh, way of um, responding, um, but I think it's a realistic way. Uh, I think that if we're avoiding askesis, whether it's in, in as an extreme sort of example as Mary of Egypt, whose icon I showed in this presentation, uh, or one of simply great Lent that we, you know, are going through now and remembering the meaning and the importance of renouncing, of surrendering certain things, even material things surrendering uh, our attachment to an egg. Um, I read on someone's Facebook uh, page this morning that 
This is day 15 without chocolate. Uh, that's exactly right. It's giving up something very specific, very material, for a much larger reason, though, than just the chocolate or the egg. Although after 40 days, an egg looks very good. Um, but that uncomfortable way of responding is what I would call the way of the cross. And that is central, I think, in Christian spirituality. We can't really have a, a theology of transfiguration without a theology of the cross. Uh, if, as I like to say, if people find or want to find a comfortable way of sitting on the cross, maybe they're not on the cross because I don't think there is a comfortable way of sitting on the cross. So maybe people are resistant to issues of ascesis, of doing with less, um, because we don't want to do with less, rather than it's not the best approach. Um, and I do find that that's ultimately where the, the problem is. Uh, with regard to vegetarianism, uh, it's, it's a difficult issue. Um, you know, there was um, a TV host here in the United States, um, Oprah Winfrey, who once uh, spoke against meat and there was a whole revolution by the meat industry against Oprah. Um, so it's not easy to speak about uh, vegetarianism without offending people, I think. And I do have to admit that I'm not a vegetarian, um, but probably out of bad habit more than anything else, certainly not out of conviction. I think that if I, if I think about vegetarianism, I have to admit it's the right way to go. If I think about our treatment of animals, I have to admit that I need to question the way we eat and what we eat. Um, and some of these things in terms of farming and agriculture are pretty obvious today, especially in the, you know, an age of the internet where we can see the exploitation um, of um, animals, um, which I would put on a par with the exploitation of uh, human beings and the exploitation of natural resources, not because they are equal uh, or equivalent in dignity or in importance, but because it's the same willingness to abuse an animal, the same willingness to abuse the earth, whether it's the rock or the soil um, or the natural gas, uh, and to argue over that uh, as nations between, you know, Greece and Turkey and Cyprus and Israel. It's, for me, just as easy and the same willingness to abuse one that is the willingness to be indifferent to poverty issues or social justice issues. Um, it's the same almost coldness or hardness of heart that... Um, either does one or the other. So that's how I think I would respond at least briefly to your question. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Father John. We have a question from one of our students and I will ask her kindly uh, to ask the question. Okay, uh, thank you, Professor Dimitriadis. Uh, uh, thank you, Professor uh, John Chrysavgis, Father John Chrysavgis, uh, you are, uh, that you are with us today. It's an honor, actually, for me too. Uh, so, uh, I think that liturgy is an obligation for many Christians. How this fact can change and uh, feel, hear the liturgy as I respond to the creation in order to reconciliate our humanity with nature. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Eleni. Um, that's, in a sense, I could say that's the question that all of us, church administrators and hierarchs, 
uh, theologians and students of theology, and every believing Christian ought to be asking every day. I don't think there's an answer that is, for instance, this is it, and once you do it, you're fine. But it is a, first of all, here is what I would say. First of all, we should be asking ourselves constantly the question you just asked, because we don't. Uh, because we, and, and here is my disappointment, I think, uh, my, my sentiment that we lost an opportunity as church and as theology over the last year with this pandemic to ask some questions about the role of the church, about the importance of the church, about the relevance even of the church and of liturgy and so forth and what the church does. And instead we, we focused on, I would say, the wrong issues. We focused on almost, to use the professor's word earlier, distractions. You know, should we be in church or not? Should we take communion or not? And if we take communion, can we get poisoned or not? Honestly, that's what we really mattered over the last year with the loss of millions of lives to this pandemic. It was a lost opportunity for me, for the church to ask itself, how exactly should it be involved in today's challenges, in today's problems? And uh, I think we missed that opportunity. I think that it, we have learned, there's no question about that, we've learned some important lessons. Um, I, I don't doubt that at all. But for the most part, I can say quite comfortably, most of our bishops, if not all, with very few exceptions, um, did not speak on issues that they should be speaking about. They, they spoke on persecution of the church, of uh, fear of the enemies of the church and uh, the state sort of oppressing the church and here in America of the rights of individuals, you know, beyond the state and beyond, you know, the church and so forth. Um, how sad that we did not ask ourselves exactly the question that you just asked. How do you connect liturgy with the rest of nature? Now, we have a liturgist uh, on the panel here um, who could speak far better than I can on, on these issues. And for us as Orthodox, it's clear whether it's in the liturgy hymns or the liturgy gestures or the liturgy uh, material elements that are used, that there's a very direct, very immediate uh, connection between the two. Um, but the sad thing is, I think that, that I spoke earlier of the importance of making connections. The sad thing is that we often disconnect our spiritual life from our secular life. I've never understood, for instance, how um, people enter the church, whether it's sometimes scientists um, or scholars. Um, educated people will enter the church and either willingly or else be forced to uh, leave their minds and hearts and professions at the door, right? As they light the candle and then they walk into another world. It shouldn't be like that. It should be us as we believe with when the priest brings out that chalice. It should be us bringing everything that we are, everything that we believe, everything that we, you know, prioritize in our lives into the church and uh, together we don't just pray in fact i would say the reason we go to church is to recognize that we fail to make those connections so we go back to church on sunday to remember the connections and we sit next to someone else not because they're also religious like us but because they too try to do what we want to do, but St. Paul says it's hard. We, we, we can't do it all the time. Most of the time we miss the mark. And we sit in church and we accept, we recognize the fact that we don't quite make those connections properly. And the irony is that Christ comes out not as deliverer when the priest comes out with communion, not as um, sovereign, as king, 
but he comes also as God broken. God sharing that broken bread. Um, uh, that's the reason, by the way, the priest breaks the bread, uh, not just because Christ did on the day, you know, of the Last Supper, not just because you need to make enough uh, bits to give to all the people that are present at church, but because it's only in brokenness that Christ comes to meet us. And it's in our brokenness that we sit together as other broken people and want to take communion, want to mend that brokenness, want to heal that brokenness. And that's how we go out, broken but resolved once again to try. We are in the world, we're not of the world, and that tension is exactly what we're doing, trying to bring together those you know, two parts of the question that you just asked. That's the story of Christianity. That's the power of Christianity. They're, the two pieces are the divine and the human or the material. And only one person, we believe, has pulled that connection off perfectly. That's Christ. The rest of us try each day, fail and get up again and try for another day to make those connections because we worship a God that is that connection of heaven and earth. So it's not really an answer as such. It's telling you that I honestly believe the question is the answer itself. The question is what we need to be asking ourselves all the time. Thank you very much, Father. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we have um, a question that's coming from uh, Italy. Uh, okay. Good afternoon and greetings. We Orthodox are used to speak of how the church should be, eschaton. Is there a problem of lack of historical awareness, catafasis, of an excessive appearing at the expense of social commitment that could be applied also to the ecological issue? And then he's thanking you. You're muted, Father John. That's a great question. Thank you for asking that, um, Dimitri. Um, yeah, I think that we have, as Orthodox, overstressed certain things. I'm now looking at and trying to sort of re-envision and review the, the image that we have of the first ecumenical council, because we're coming up to the, the anniversary of that. Um, 2000 years, or what was it, 1700 years since then. Um, so I'm beginning to think about how the Orthodox Church has sort of uh, expressed and also implemented its theology over the centuries. And I think we do have to agree that we've been fairly weak, especially in the Eastern Church, uh, on the more social the more political, the more economic issues, where the West has, for reasons we would like to question and perhaps are entitled to question, but the West has, in a way, uh, excelled in many of these reasons, in many of these issues, uh, including mission, for instance. Um, I do think that we have misunderstood, however, even our emphasis on eschatology, because I don't think that's necessarily where we get it wrong. It's the way we understand or interpret eschatology and the end times, whether we see it as uh, something that comes, you know, at the end of life, and that's when it matters, or something that comes at the end of a theology book as a kind of a last, uh, almost unnecessary chapter that no one really understands anyway, or whether we see it the way many evangelicals, uh, Protestants uh, here in the United States, for instance, that see the eschaton as a kind of an apocalypse, um, the end sort of uh, revelation and revolution of nature um, that they champion as almost a destruction of nature. And since 
uh, Christ will come again and uh, remake all of nature, well, maybe we don't have to work towards its transfiguration. It's a, it's a waste of time. But that's not, I think, uh, the Christian uh, worldview. Uh, it's the, the Christian worldview, again, to go back um, to uh, the question asked by Eleni, is all about making the connections between the other world and this world, not disconnecting those two, never disassociating uh, those two. The last things, I, the way I like to translate the last things, ta uh, eschata, in English, is uh, to understand them as the lastness of everything, the lastingness of everything. The fact that anything and everything that we do and see and experience now has an endless effect and repercussion that we call, for want of a better word, in theological technical terminology, eschatological. That's what eschatology is. It's not after all of these things. It's these things in their lastingness, these things in their perspective of eternity, seeing everything with the eyes, as St. John Climacus says, whom we remembered uh, the other day, um, with the eyes of the heaven. Uh, so that means that the way I respond to this world, the way I respond to the body, the way I respond to material things, the way I respond to political things, social things, that will determine, define what I believe about the next life. And if what I believe about the next night life has no connection with what I want to transfigure in this life, then for me, it's meaningless. It's pointless. The way I profess heaven should matter in terms of the way I perceive the earth. So we have, I think, um, uh, probably from as early as, you know, people like Metropolitan John of Pergamon would say from as early as the fifth century, um, uh, been, you know, hit, prioritized to a more spiritual, a more mystical sort of interpretation of the world. And that's our strength, even in ecumenical circles. They're always speaking about, oh, the Orthodox will bring in the mystical dimension. They will bring in the liturgical dimension. And I, whenever I hear that, it sounds so jarring in my ears and in my mind uh, that we are sort of reduced to that. Um, and the fact is that we've, we've done that ourselves. We like to think we are different in that respect. We like to think that we have, you know, almost like a monopoly on the spiritual, you know, dimension of uh, theology or sociology and so forth. But again, any disconnection of this life from the next is dangerous, as I said in the lecture, to both. It does harm to this life, of course, I believe. I think it does harm to our theology of the afterlife as well. So this is why for 30 years, the patriarch has been emphasizing that climate change is a theological issue as well as a political issue. It's a spiritual and ethical issue as well as a scientific and technological issue. You can't resolve things in isolation. Religion has a very key role to play but a key role to play in terms of how it influences our relationship to our neighbor, to our society, uh, and to the natural world. And uh, again, I do think that in the orthodox circles, we have missed that connection, that we have uh, overemphasized the spiritual to the detriment almost of the material, uh, overemphasized the heavenly dimension to the earthly dimension. But again, the way I said earlier, the aim is to bring those two sides together. The aim is to bring the two natures of Christ together in our life by God's grace as well. Uh, the aim is, as we say in the Lord's Prayer, that 
everything in heaven should also be the same way on earth. Thank you very much, uh, Father John. During COVID times, it's very difficult to fly, as you know, and difficult to move from place to place. But we're moving from Italy to Kenya now. And we have uh, our student, Jeffrey Mugadidzi. We kindly ask him to take the word and ask the question. Jeffrey. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, Jeffrey. Yes, thank you for good presentation. You have watched throughout your presentation. Kindly, I have a few reservations for my questions. One is that, you know, the church does not live in isolation with the world. The church does not live in isolation with the world. So, how can church come up with the policies that can help to save the world in environmental conservation? Since the secular leaders are coming from the church, most of them, and they are members of the church. If we see the church coming with these policies throughout, I'm sure the secular world will want to do something for the church. That's the first question. The second one, it is in WCC, the World Church Council. They have a department that deals with environmental, issue of environment, you know. They have been talking all over having these policies, but we don't see it in the local parishes. We are not seeing like our, 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 our priest advance in what is happening in the, in the conference. So can we say that it's only dealing on the upper level, but at the lower level, there's nothing happening on the ground. Yet the people who are contributing to environmental destruction come from our neighbors, that we are part of it. Then the la I think then the other issue that I can I want to raise is about the issue of what is happening all over our world, the issue of war in all our regions, whether it's in Africa, part of the Europe, Asia, we see there are wars all over. Even government top, even government toppling the other government, you see, the issue of dictatorship. But they, the church exists in those areas. The people who are procuring weapons come from the church. The people who are manufacturing these weapons, some of them are church members. So are we really advocating it on the ground, everyone to be involved in the issue environment? Because if the church will not come back to the ground, on the ground here, I mean the local parishes level, we start from there as we go up. We cannot achieve what we want. Thank you very much. Uh, so Jeffrey, I mean, uh, my um, dilemma and my concerns are exactly the same as yours. I share, you know, the, the worry that we have about where the church is and what the church is doing. Uh, you mentioned about uh, being on the ground. Uh, I often like to say that, um, you know, all of the early Christian heresies uh, had a problem, not with God's divinity, because that's easy to accept. It's easy to accept the higher power. It's easy to accept that, you know, someone within me or outside me or above me or beneath me somehow influences and shapes and inspires my life. The hard bit was the human nature of Christ, not the divine one. The hard bit was for the early church to grapple with and define Christ as fully divine and fully human. As I like to say to students, the problem is Christ as divinity, God as uh, divine, it is difficult to make 
touchdown, complete touchdown, you know, like a rocket. If it's even a little bit above the ground, it's more comfortable to deal with because it's the divinity. I mean, that's what Nestorianism was all about. Nestorius could not accept a God that was really like me. I mean, he, he actually says, I cannot accept a God that is a baby that dirties itself. But that's Christianity, right? It's literally God taking on every single thing, every single experience without sin. So let me look at the three points you, you mentioned. First of all, you're right. The church should not be doing things in isolation. And it does, unfortunately. Uh, the church should be able, and this is where I think there's no question that the, the church has um, a, a, a power that can make a difference um, uh, in the way that we respond to challenges uh, of our world. It, it's what we might call the prophetic element of the church. That's where the church should be, not in its own issues, not obsessed with its own internal conflicts, not obsessed with an autocephaly or obsessed with, you know, a liturgy, but prophesizing in the world, motivating. The government will respond one way or another, but the church can make a big difference in the way it responds, the way that government will respond. It's not the church that will respond necessarily, but it can influence people. Um, the second point you said was the, the ecumenical um, emphasis. And I mentioned earlier, it was 1975 that the World Council was dealing with these issues already, uh, way before even the Orthodox. Um, and we have not, you said our local priest and it's not just your local priest. The reality is um, that here in the United States, where I would say we've made a lot of headway on environmental issues and raising awareness in parishes and so forth, we're still very, very far behind. At the moment, yes, it's only on that level of the patriarch really making statements either to other heads of churches or other heads of state. It's rare or minimal in terms of uh, looking for um, a response uh, on the parish level. In fact, the pandemic has paradoxically been almost a blessing uh, here in America where uh, parishes, mostly through young people, mind you, have forced us uh, in the archdiocese to reach out to parishes. And we've, we've seen that in just literally in the last three, four months where uh, um, a handful of young people, almost all of them young adult women, in fact, uh, approached me as, the, as people have done in the past to, to see, you know, how we can promote uh, these issues. And I work within the ecumenical office of the Archdiocese here. And we really took on a campaign to reach out to parishes that is growing very quickly over the last uh, few weeks and, and months. But it takes some initiative. Uh, it takes a lot longer to do what I think should be done in response uh, to Jeffrey's question, and that is priests should be trained, first of all, in these issues. If you look at seminary curriculum, it doesn't contain these issues at all, or at best it might contain a lecture about the environment, like mine today, for instance. Or it might contain, if you're really good at it, and it's very rare, but, you know, some Vladimir's has done it, Holy Cross has done it once, you know, maybe an elective on environmental care and so forth. But that's not what I'm talking about or what you're hoping to see from the church. I'm talking about every subject in a theological curriculum being inspired by, imbued with, and um, involving creation care. How do you talk about the Old Testament without talking about the environment? How do you talk about the New Testament and the word of God assuming flesh without centering on the environment? How do you talk about liturgy without centering on the environment? How do you talk about social issues without 
centering on the environment and all the issues that you said, rightly so, that are connected to this. The oil crisis and the wars, um, the weapons and the wealth that's wasted over these weapons, uh, the refugee crisis. How can you not talk about creation care uh, and the abuse of um, the environment? So all of these, I think, should be part and parcel of a kind of a, a holistic approach to theology, uh, not just seeing them as separate issues, or to use your words, not just isolating environmental issues uh, from other issues in our society today. And I, after the great council of the Orthodox Church, just, just a few years ago in 2016 in Crete, um, which, mind you, the main reason for that council in my eyes was to bring churches precisely out of that isolation and to put them together in one room. That's the hardest thing to do, right? That's, that's in fact, all we have to do as Christians. The late Professor Nisiotis used to say, all you have to do to heal the world is put everyone in the same room to say, our father, just all together, our father. So that for me was what the council was about, bringing churches together, but it's hard. It's hard in a family, let alone in you know, a group of 14 or 15 churches. So bringing them together was one half, if you like, of the difficulty, the barrier. The other was getting them to face the issues that mattered. And the Orthodox churches struggled so hard to avoid the issues that mattered, all right? So th this was their chance to speak to the world as one. And they did, they did utter something, but it was also uh, unsatisfactory. It was really not enough, but it was a first step. So I remember his All Holiness, the ecumenical patriarch, um, speaking to him over a number of um, meetings after the Great Council, um, and uh, him really wondering, really worried about what it is that can come out of this council in terms of consequences, repercussions, not on the administrative side, not on the ecclesiastical side. That stuff will go on for ages. That is eschatological. <laughs> It'll just continue as problems of the Orthodox Church forever. But what can the churches say to the contemporary world? That was really his dilemma, his, his concern. And out of these discussions came uh, a decision to spell out, because uh, one thing I did say to the patriarch was there are a lot of churches who are disappointed in the council because they believe that the council somehow betrayed orthodoxy. And a lot, of, a lot of these, you know, individual theologians, uh, even churches, make a lot of noise over that. You know, the council betrayed orthodoxy. It wasn't as orthodox as it should be. It didn't hold to terminology of the past and so forth. And I said to the patriarch, the truth is, at least in terms of the way the ecumenical patriarchate sees the world in its own churches, within its own jurisdiction, the truth is the great council didn't go far enough didn't go anywhere near where it should have gone in terms of grappling with the issues of the world. And so the Patriarch decided to establish a commission three years ago now to try and come up with some guidelines of, uh, again, through the eyes of the Patriarchate, he, the commission was not involving people from other churches or other jurisdictions and so forth, so as not to be seen as uh, imposing its uh, opinions on other churches. But uh, through the eyes and the tradition and the experience and the history of the ecumenical patriarch, how do we think our Christians as Orthodox Christians should be reflecting on contemporary issues and challenges? And so this committee, which actually reached out, the patriarch reached out to all of the bishops of the ecumenical patriarchate, asking for input from them 
um, in terms of uh, what are the issues that they face in their diocese? What is it that they would, uh, you know, that would help them if they were to continue this ministry in, you know, the 21st century? Uh, and a, a whole bunch of bishops responded, um, more so than to many encyclicals the Patriarch sends out to bishops for response. Um, a whole group of uh, hierarchs that established committees in their own dioceses. One of them did a surveys among school kids, high school kids and college uh, students. Uh, others um, called together a committee of lay people and clergy, uh, scientists and scholars and doctors and physicians and so forth to try and respond to the patriarch's um, request from which came a document that was synodally, formally endorsed by the Patriarchate about a year ago now. It was published actually Lent of last year, just at the beginning of the pandemic, um, on the social guidelines, if you like, of the Orthodox Church. That the Orthodox Church, going back to uh, Dimitri's question earlier, usually avoids we avoid talking about what we should be doing in the world, right? We avoid talking about that. That's almost, first of all, one problem with that is the Catholics and the Protestants deal with that. Well, we have to be different. How on earth can we touch those topics? But if you look at the gospel, that's all I read in the gospel. How and who are we to exclude those issues from our worldview? And our theology. So this uh, text was written, you can find it on the internet, it's entitled For the Life of the World, and it's just beginning to gain traction actually with, uh, within churches um, and within uh, theological schools, and within theological journals, uh, ecumenical circles as well, uh, because there are not many. Uh, we had no other document to go by. There is a document that is well written, in fact, um, by the Russian church exactly 20 years ago, uh, in, in the year 2000, uh, which to their credit, the, the Church of Moscow, as it was coming out of, you know, from behind the Iron Curtain, asked itself, what is our role in the world today? It's, it's a different world, different leaders, different politicians, different state. How are we to respond? Now, in my opinion, it's a little negative, let's say, by at least the standards of the ecumenical patriarchate, because for the most part, they saw the world as evil. For the most part, they saw the world as something to be saved by us, all right? Not something that we can be involved in and transform. Uh, but again, to their credit, they did this text I called the social concept of the Russian Orthodox Church, um, very well written. Um, it was spearheaded by the current patriarch of Moscow, uh, Patriarch Kirill. Again, to his credit, he brought together some very good theologians to produce this text. The sad thing for me is that today, 20 years later, Patriarch Kirill probably wouldn't accept the same text that he sort of proposed and commissioned 20 years ago. Even that text, which for me is fairly negative, is probably too liberal for Patriarch Kirill today. So that is kind of sad for me that I feel the Church of Russia actually has taken a step back from where it was 20 years ago. So, but we had no other texts to go by. We didn't, we didn't consult in terms of learning from the texts of the Catholic Church because of the conservative nature of our theologians and churches that would immediately blame us for certain connections and so forth. Although we did see from them what are the issues that they dealt with, and we ultimately saw that we're more or less, we're in the same world. Of course, we're dealing with the same topics and the same challenges. So we have produced this text. I hope you might look at it and respond to it uh, in, in some way. It's not there as prescriptions. Uh, it's not there as rules. It's there as reflections and guidelines, insights on how orthodox theology can actually inspire um, a balanced and evangelical in the sense of scriptural 
uh, engagement with the world. Okay, thank you very much, Jeff, for the question and uh, Father John for the answers, of course. Clearly, we're moving rapidly from uh, Kenya to Tubingen because we can fly that uh, <laughs> with, with, with the help of the, uh, of the Zoom platform. And I will ask uh, Angelina before, to ask the question before, and then after this, I will ask um, uh, kindly if, uh, since they honored with, the, with, with their presence, they honored us, I will ask uh, professors. Uh, uh, by Raktaris, uh, Stathokosta, and uh, Moschos, Ralph Kumarianos, for a, just a small short comment. But first, a word to Angelina. Hello to everybody. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation and your speech. I have to say that most of the considerations I had have been already addressed. So I have remained with the last one that's a little bit provocative. You have mentioned, and I agree with that, that. In the Orthodox Church, we are afraid a little bit to address issues regarding environment because we compare ourselves with um, Western churches. But that's one perspective because like every coin, there is also another one that we see some very few exceptions, very few academics or members of the clergy that they try to address these issues, but they try to copy what Catholics and Protestants do. For example, I noticed that you mentioned vegetarianism slash veganism, let's say, as an action of facilitating the environment and the extinction of the animals, etc. Meanwhile, if we consider if we consider the concept of fasting in the Orthodox world and how wide and spread is the Orthodox world, so the needs of the believers can be very, very different across the globe. I think. It's kind of neoliberal to try to address things in a vegetarian way or in this green, political green, eco-friendly way of the first world. I think that Orthodox Christianity, because of the, um, the numbers of the believers, because of the geographical positions that most of the churches are placed, we face a completely different reality and we have a very different tradition as well regarding the environment than, than the Protestants and the Catholics, mostly in the first world. So I would like to see from the side of the Orthodox Church or from, from the people who would like to work in this direction, I am one of them, what we can do using our Orthodox background to address this neoliberalism that has started to infect somehow also the Orthodox Church. Um, Angelina, just before you go off, uh, can you define how you see neoliberalism? Yes, I can give you a very um, a ecological example of this definition. I live in a city, in a town that is very green. The major is from the Green Party and everything here looks like um, came directly from the future, like electric cars, electric buses, no drivers, People recycle and upcycle everything, but at the same time are the same people that they are going to buy a car that maybe is eco-friendly and green, but to produce this car, the damage and the stigma in the environment was way bigger, are the same people who say I meditate and I'm vegan, but I eat the avocados from Peru, creating another kind of ecological imbalance, or they go to Goa in India every weekend because they have the financial surface to do so. And obviously they choose an eco-friendly, eco-green flight, but they fly every week to India from Germany. So we can understand that, yes, they are very green, they are vegan, vegetarian, yogis, take electric cars, etc. But at the same time, this is a very neoliberal capitalistic way of forming this. They are still consumers and they still don't get out of their comfort zone and their churches support this style and this way of living. Thank you. And thanks for clarifying as well. Uh, it's how I understood. And I think it's a correct criticism. Um, I don't think it's necessarily, let's say, a reason not to be involved in what we've talked about so far. 
but it is a reason, I think, to be aware of why we're doing what we're doing as Orthodox Christians. Uh, first of all, in terms of, um, you know, doing things um, the way other churches uh, do things and copying, and this is why, as I said, we, when we worked on this uh, document on the social ethos of the church, which has been translated into German, by the way, recently. Um, it, um, it, we were careful not to, well, a couple of things. First of all, we were careful because of the mandate from the patriarch himself, not to include our own, as much as we could, obviously, our own ideas or priorities or prejudices. Um, that this was to be a document that somehow reflected, as the Patriarch called it, where the Orthodox Church, at least in the Ecumenical Patriarchate, is more or less up to, and what issues we are facing, and how we can face them. Um, however, um, sometimes it's not wrong to be in the same circle as people that aren't necessarily with us 100%, right? Um, and again, I'm just getting to the answer of your question, so don't hold on to every phrase until we get to that. But, um, uh, you know, almost like Christ said, if they're casting out demons, what's your problem here? You know, you don't have to necessarily protest or shut them out. Um, I remember visiting very early on, and I was very young too, it must have been like, 35, 36 years old, um, a cardinal as soon as I had arrived here in America. And uh, one of the cardinals was responsible for a new statement on the, um, the, the position of the Catholic Church on issues of creation care. It was going to be the first American bishop's statement. Um, that was back in the uh, mid 90s. Um, and so I visited him, very, you know, arrogant young theologian, and I, I thought I'm going to visit this uh, cardinal. He's very important in the Catholic Church, and I'm going to go and tell him, hey, you know, the Orthodox Church and the Ecumenical Patriarch, they're involved in these issues, and you should put us in the encyclical as well. Um, so I went to visit him, and I remember like a good Catholic bishop, not too many Orthodox bishops would do this, he had read two of my books in preparation of my visit to his office, or rather in good Catholic tradition, he had asked someone else to read my books and give him notes of my positions on various issues. And he was well prepared. And I remember his strongest, what as he thought his strongest sort of point was, that I want to be very careful, he said, as a Roman Catholic bishop, as someone you know, with responsibility and accountability to the truth of the Catholic Church. Not to be seen, he said, as uh, being on the same wagon as all other people, like the atheists, the secularists, the greenists, the lobbyists, the politicians, um, you know, the, 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 uh, the magicians and so forth, the weakens and whatever. And I thought for a moment, I mean, obviously, I, you know, I, I, I know that it's important to distinguish these sort of things as well. But I remember my answer again as a young, brash, you know, kid saying to him, why not? I would say that that's where the church is called to be, exactly where other people are and don't hear the word of God. That is exactly where the church should be not in its own comfort zone, but actually in its discomfort zone, talking about the differences that you mentioned between consumerism and capitalism, and when we speak green, what it means, but nonetheless being there in conversation with these people. So it is about conversation. It is about connections that I spoke of earlier, and it's about awareness. We do have the practice of fasting, which has profound implications for the way we treat creation and God's gift to us. But most of us are unaware of those connections. Most of us don't realize just how profound and how influential fasting during Lent is 
as a social statement almost by the Orthodox Church to the rest of the world. So do we go for a Green New Deal or whatever, or do we not? I'm not scared to go out for a Green New Deal because economy needs to be reconsidered. You know, industry needs to be reconsidered. And it's not about do we eat meat or do we not eat meat? As I said earlier, I do, probably out of bad habit, as I said, and I admit that. If I were more disciplined, I probably would stop it. Probably not good for me anyway. But it's a matter of awareness. Just knowing, just for one, you know, for 40 days in Lent, doing things differently makes me aware of the things that I still do the rest of the year. It doesn't mean I stop eating meat or dairy products. It may mean that for some. It means reordering things, remembering we're the center of things because we tend to forget the center goes off into other sort of priorities. It's why we go to church on Sundays, not because we're supposed to be in church all the time, but because church is supposed to transform 365 days of the year, seven days a week, not the one. It's why we take communion because our whole life is supposed to be communion. These are tangible, practical, down to the ground, down to earth, reminders of where we ought to be all of our life. So green is good, go for green. But I would say exactly as you're saying, Angelina, that our role is also to remind people that green is not enough, that green is a first start of awareness, but it could be that we haven't changed at all. And I'm glad that you bring in, you know, the, the first world sort of perspective here, because yes, some people are comfortable enough to be able to say, I don't have to drive a car that spends a lot of gas. I can afford an electric car, but that's not going green for me. That's not respecting God's creation. So you're right to say, if our, worldview, if our perspective doesn't change, it doesn't matter if we're doing things on, oh, well, it's obviously still better for the earth that someone doesn't travel as much or doesn't, you know, waste as much and so forth. But it's not just about feeling good or sounding politically correct. It's about making radical changes which are hard to make, which is, I think, why I am always criticized about asceticism. And in the early days when I would write about asceticism, I would try to respond and try to, you know, create an answer that would make sense to people. I've come to the point of being convinced that nobody likes to talk about asceticism. That's why they don't like the word. There's a cost involved, right? There's, there's a price to pay. You don't just get to smile you don't just get to buy a nicer car and think you've solved the problem. So I agree with you. And by the way, I would uh, say something uh, in terms of self-criticism. You know, we say that we have a different tradition from the Catholics and the Protestants, and you know, we haven't damaged, ever done as much damage to the world and so forth. I, in terms of a kind of a self-reflection here, I would say we haven't done as much damage to the world, whether through missions or corporations or whatever, probably because we haven't had the opportunity to. Had we had the opportunity, we probably would have done the same thing, unfortunately. Uh, if we were true to our principles, then Athens and Moscow would not be polluted. They would be very beautiful cities, but they're not, because this is a human factor here. This is an element of the fall, if you like, that we have to keep struggling against, both as Orthodox and as non-Orthodox, both as religious and as secular people. What to say now? Okay, since we're running out of time, but I gave my words to, I mean, just not a question though, just a one minute comment. Please, not a question. By, uh, so, uh, Professor uh, Bustino, just a, just a comment, please, on the question. Yes. 
Yes, uh, thank you very much uh, for your wonderful and excellent uh, presentation. Just as a comment, as uh, Professor Nikolos asked, uh, it came to my mind that there's no any kind of, of that we have a Protestant forest or a Muslim river or an Orthodox mountain, it all belong to all, and we are all responsible for the earth to, to preserve it. <clears throat> Just I, I was wondering if we should extend, in a sense, the principle coming from the gospel to love our neighbor, to, 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 to move it and think of love our neighborhood, something which could be more inclusive, where and uh, something to, to end with is, uh, it came to my mind, uh, Walter Brugman, an Old uh, Testament uh, scholar who wrote extensively on the issue of uh, theology of land. And uh, he says that God uh, doesn't give land to people, but God gives people to land in order to take care of it and make it flourish. And uh, also it, bring, it brought to my mind the, the, the paradigm, the example of, of uh, the Babylonian exile, right? Where God exiles the people of, of Israel away from, uh, from the land. So to give to land some time, some rest from people's uh, sins. So um, with that uh, comment, I would like to thank you uh, once more for your wonderful uh, presentation, and I hope that I kept my promise also to Nicholas <laughs> for the time limit. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, it's okay with me. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Father uh, uh, John. Um, what I keep and I would like to underline is uh, that uh, our job as Orthodox uh, Church is to influence to inspire people to change their perspective uh, on about the earth and uh, also i would add to to find a common orthodox perspective and to speak with one voice uh, concerning the environmental issue uh, this is th something very important i think that uh, we don't uh, have yet. I and agree with you, and I, in fact, in recent uh, months, in various uh, discussions, one of the good things of COVID is we've been able to reach so many more people uh, in so many more places on so many more issues uh, through, you know, Zoom meetings and so forth. Um, but uh, a couple of times now, the this issue that you mentioned has come up, and maybe we should look into it. That. You know, if we can't agree on certain things as Orthodox churches, I wonder if we can agree at least on the way that we treat God's creation. So, thank you. And uh, last but not least, Professor Moskos. Thank you. Thank you also for your uh, uh, beautiful presentation. I would like only uh, uh, shortly to, to uh, stress the theological background you mentioned that we usually um, um, uh, treat the uh, the ecological the uh, the the, the uh, factor of ecology, connecting it with a sort of protological discourse, a sort of um, um, conserving the, the initial uh, perfect world who was, was given to us, and so on. And so it is unconsciously it implies that we have a detachment from the world. So, the, like the, the Moscow statement you mentioned, that it's an evil, and we have to to preserve all these things. But you, you said um, uh, very, very uh, keenly that um, we have to stress the, the eschatological aspect and to see how can we engage uh, uh, with, with, uh, the, uh, with the revelation of God to um, cooperate for a better world. So that in the more active way to see this course to the eschaton, this is much more um, um, uh, um, energetic, much, much more active and it implies also the question of, of the relations between um, between a people that what An An Angelina uh, implied that we have also the problem of social justice and all these things integral to the point of of how, in, in uh, uh, of uh, what sort of world we live in. So I would like to to, to say this. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Professor. And I, I think you're right. It's it's hard work. If it was easy, there would be no asking needed, okay? It's hard work 
pull this off. It's hard work to try to make connections constantly. Uh, it's hard work to think about what you're eating and where it's coming from and what you're driving and where that comes from. It's hard work to remember uh, to make the connections in our um, uh, theological curricula and so forth. Um, but that the, the hard work, I think, is what we're called to do. And that's what makes it sacred work in the end. And the, the whole notion of um, from neighbor to neighborhood. It, it is, that, that, that's the connection we need to make. And in terms of, since most of you are good uh, ecumenical theologians as well, um, I could say we have learned through ecumenical and interfaith um, dialogue that we can't any longer treat people like things. Well, creation care is taking that one step further. It's getting to the point of being able to recognize that we can't even treat things like things anymore. Everything is a gift from God for the life of the world. I am very honored by all of your questions and your participation. Okay. Thank you very, very much, uh, Father John. I don't know what they say uh, for rich people, whether they're going to enter heaven or not. I feel very rich today. Uh, but still, it's okay, because uh, I will just stay here on earth listening and enjoying profound thoughts and words by you and all of you that participated uh, today. Uh, so thank you once more, uh, Professor Reverend uh, John Hesavius, for sharing your knowledge, uh, but mostly for the love for what you do. And uh, I know I didn't keep my promise for the 40 minutes, but I kept my promise. I didn't ask you, you know, to sing, even though I believe you have a beautiful voice. So good evening to all of you. Uh, thank you for everything and uh, we'll uh, meet uh, soon. Thank you, Nico. Thank you, everyone. Kalo Pascha.